Hi everyone, I'm Brian with the Scientist in Every Florida School program. And in this edition of Science Segments, I'm excited to connect you to a scientist to help you learn about symbiotic relationships. Who are you and what is your title? Hey Brian, uh, my name is Roy Yanong and I'm actually a professor and extension veterinarian based out of the Tropical Aquaculture Lab. I've got a drone shot of our uh, facility right here they, um, in Ruskin. We do a lot of work with fish farmers and um, a lot of natural resource agencies. And actually, um, let me share a screen real quick. This is again a, a little overhead shot of our lab. We've got uh, a lot of different ponds here. We do a lot of work with, again, with uh, aquaculture in the state of Florida. There's a lot of fish farmers in the area um, and we help them in all sorts of ways. My area is fish health and disease. Uh, we also work with fish and wildlife. Um, one of the big things I do is I uh, run a diagnostic lab. If you guys see here, I've got some sick fish on there, different things we do to check for bacteria and look for parasites. You know, we'll talk a little bit about parasitism um, in the next uh, little section. Um, but we do a lot of work with trying to help the farmers solve any health or disease issues and also programs to um, maybe teach them as well as students and others about fish health and fish health management. Um, one of the things, for example, people probably don't think about, we've actually worked with farms to vaccinate their fish. You know, if fish get a disease and we want to try to prevent that disease, some of these um, diseases we can actually develop a vaccine for with some of our my uh, colleagues. And so this was a tilapia facility that we did a vaccine for. We uh, vaccinated about 8,000 fish, which is a lot of fish by hand. You can see uh, one of my students there doing a work there. Uh, I also have done some consulting out of the country. So this is me working with some folks in the Caribbean, in the Dominican Republic, uh, where they were having some problems with, with these guys. Some of you may recognize cobia. They're a, a big game fish in and around Florida, as well as other parts of the world. They were actually breeding them for food. And you can see this guy, hopefully you can see he's got kind of a white area around his eyes. It feels like all messed up. So he was really sick. They were losing a lot of them. So I actually uh, flew over there and helped them with their problem there. Uh, we also have done surgeries, lots of things you people probably don't think about that you can do with fish. So that's kind of a little bit of intro to what I do. A lot of my research is, is aimed at helping those folks as well as folks in um, natural resource and, you know, including some of the people working with corals and sea urchins, et cetera. So a little bit of a mix, but my um, main focus is with fish. Can you briefly describe some of the relationships among organisms? Sure. So I thought maybe a little bit of chart, charting here will help you guys. There's definitely a lot of different other relationships. These are some of the main ones. And the way I kind of like to think about it is like, who's gonna win? You've got two organisms. One is um, maybe gonna affect the other, maybe not. One may win and one may lose. And so maybe that's, that's a way of looking at it. We've got five different types of uh, uh, interactions we're gonna talk about. Mutualism, commensalism, competition, parasitism here, and predation. So again, there's other sort of relationships, but these are the five we'll focus on. So when uh, we talk about these, I want you to think about who's winning, who's losing, or is it kind of neutral? So I've got kind of beneficial, which would be, you know, which, which one is winning, detrimental, you know, which one is losing in red on the bottom. And then here in the middle, it's kind of neutral. The organism is really not winning or losing. So let's start with the first one, mutualism. So in mutualism, both of them win. The really important one people are familiar with, um, actually let's go back here, is, is uh, the importance of the honeybee. Uh, everybody knows honeybees are really critical to uh, both farmers as well as just natural resource ecology. They uh, pollinate all sorts of plants, including crops. Um, they're really important for you know, that, that function alone and, and they're really, really, really important. So um, there's a lot of issues with the honeybees at this stage, but they benefit by getting food from the uh, from the the flowers that they're po and eventually pollinating, but they're also helping the plants by pollinating and causing um, seed production, etc. So that's a mutualistic interaction. Um, the slide I had before is coral. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that coral are actually two organisms kind of tied together. So I've got a kind of a little cartoon of a coral here. We're taking a little circle section, blowing it up, and then showing you sort of what's going on the edge of the coral. So you've got these coral polyps. They're kind of like little anemones, but because coral are, um, are colonial, they have all these 
sort of polyps that are uh, living together and, and interacting with each other. A part of these corals are going to have different um, skin layers, uh, or, they, or they're comprised of different skin layers. And in one of those skin layers, they have these algae, essentially, called zooxanthellae. And these zooxanthellae are one-celled algae. They're really important to the coral because they will provide, um, the coral provides nutrients that the algae can use to make sugars and other things that then the coral can use. So that's, again, another mutualistic, and for Florida, really important um, uh, relationship that you all should be aware of. So two examples of mutualism. All right, let's talk about commensalism now. So commensalism, we can consider one of the organisms is winning, and the other is not winning or losing, just kind of neutral. And I, I have a really a pretty popular example everybody knows about, cataligrids. Uh, we got cataligrids and cattle all over Florida. You see uh, cataligrids there kind of just hanging out on top of one of the cattle. But uh, what the cataligrids do is when the, uh, when the the cattle are kind of grazing and disturbing any of the substrate or grass. They're going to be allowing some of these insects and other things to sort of start moving around and then the cattle egrets will go and sort of eat and feed on those things that are getting disrupted by the movements of the cattle. And so you can see that, of course, the uh, cattle egrets are getting food, but the cattle is really not affecting them one way or another. They're sort of just kind of there. So that is a commensal relationship with the cattle being kind of the neutral party and the cattle egret being the, the beneficiary or the, the one that's winning. All right, so the third kind of uh, relationship we're going to talk about is competition. And you guys, everyone's familiar with competition. You're competing in sports, you know, usually, um, you know, people are putting a lot of effort into it. Um, with animals, it's kind of a similar situation here. And my example here are two important fish in Florida. Um, one of them is the largemouth bass, which you can see there uh, on the upper left, and the other is the peacock bass, which is actually uh, an intended and intentional introduction by a Florida Fish and Wildlife into South Florida because it's a really good game fish. They put it into canals, which don't really have normal kind of populations of fish. Um, you know, uh, they're, they're man-made, and they've become a really important sport fish. Now, if these two are in the same water, they're going to be competing for the same prey items. Um, and potentially same, uh, you know, other resources that are important. So I put a little bluegill here in the middle. And so the, the competition kind of overall, big picture wise, we sort of consider them both to sort of lose because they both have to put a lot of energy into fighting or to, um, you know, to the, to the struggle, essentially. Obviously, one of them is going to get the fish, but, you know, the other one may get it next time. So it's not necessarily like a lose, but they're, they, are, they are losing it to a degree because they're putting a lot of effort into uh, the resource um, and, and they're not just able to use it right away. All right, so the next is parasitism. Uh, everyone's kind of familiar with parasites. You know, your dog can, or cat can get fleas, you know, people get tapeworms, you know, not everybody, but some people. So, so parasites is a, is a concept you're probably familiar with. I'm going to show you a parasite that we deal with with uh, fish farmers and, and, um, and other, uh, even in actual natural water, water bodies because these parasites can affect uh, other species of fish in Florida as well. And this is called uh, the fish louse. So this is a case I had many uh, years ago, um, holding up a koi here. You are familiar with koi, they're related to goldfish. Um, you might be able to see all these little tiny, kind of greenish, but they're sort of clear little dots all over. This koi had literally hundreds and hundreds of this, which is known as a fish louse. I kind of blew up the picture here. You can see they're a little bit transparent, but essentially what these things are doing are taking like a little needle-like um, extension of their mouth, sticking it in, sucking juices out of the fish. So they're parasitizing, basically getting nutrients from the fish, whereas the fish, of course, is a loser in all this because it's getting its life basically sucked out of it. Um, so in this case, the parasite is the winner, and then the fish is the loser. So there's one winner and one loser. All right, and then the last one we're going to talk about is predation. Everyone's pretty familiar with predation as well, but it is, you know, officially a relationship between organisms. Um, one predator and one prey. I'm going to talk about another kind of Florida related uh, scenario here. And this is the, uh, the um, Goliath grouper, formerly known as the Jewfish, the Goliath grouper, and crustaceans as, as well as fish. I used a, a crab here as our crustacean or our, our prey. So Goliath grouper, as many of you probably know, can get really huge. They can get really, really, really large. 
They eat all sorts of things, including um, octopus and fish and crustaceans like crabs. And so as you can imagine, really, really big fish, little tiny uh, crab there, it's going to be eating that crab. And yeah, predation is pretty much a win for the grouper and a loss for the crab, except that the crab dies. So with predation, you know, real predation, one organism typically is going to die as a result. And so that's probably like the ultimate loss, I guess you can consider that. So kind of in a, a little bit of a summary here, we talked about mutualism where you've got two wins. Bees and a lot of the plants and flowers and crops both win. Uh, corals with those one-celled algae or zooxanthellae also both win. Commensal, we had the cattle egret and the cattle. So the cattle egret gets food, the cattle it doesn't really care, it's just moving around. Competition, even though one of the fish is going to win at least food or maybe even shelter, etc., there is kind of a loss overall because they both have to put a lot of energy into, do, into doing that. Parasitism, the parasite is, is getting nutrients from the host, but the host, in this case the koi, loses. And then in predation, of course, uh, our goliath grouper wins because it gets food. The poor crab loses because it gets eaten. So. That, that's hopefully a little bit of a uh, summary and you guys can kind of get a better understanding of what all those terms mean. Thank you, Dr. Yanong, and thank you all so much for watching. We will see you next time.